So just last month, my new book came out, Better Money, Gold, Fiat, or Bitcoin. The question is, which of these is the better money? Uh, and they don't say best money or ideal money because it may be something else. I don't want to rule that out. Uh, when I ran this title by George Selgin, he said, that's a terrible title. And I said, George, it's based on your book, Good Money. <laughs> Just taking it one step further. And I think he came around to uh, it, but... I'm working on best money now. Okay, good. <laughs> so you'll see there, gold is one of the candidates and Bitcoin is one of the candidates. Uh, but I'm very happy to uh, have this entire conference theme be so uh, tailor-made for making my arguments, which I'm going to draw from the book, uh, but you get the half-hour preview of the book. Uh, took me longer than half an hour to write it. Let's see, which button is making them advance? Uh, there we go. So what we have today is uh, fiat money, and the, the, what distinguishes a fiat money from a commodity-based money uh, is pretty easily illustrated. The U.S. dollar bill used to say, will pay to the bearer on demand, meaning gold coin. And that was replaced by just ribbon, 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 $100. So that's just a declaration. It's as money by decree. And a fiat, of course, is a decree. Uh, in the original Latin meaning, back when God used to speak Latin, he said, fiat lux, let there be light. Let there be money, and, that, and uh, it's money. So that's the origin of the name fiat money. But uh, the difference, of course, is that the quantity of money is governed in a different way uh, than that of a commodity money. Why did we move to a regime of fiat money? I think actually the comedian, Dave Barry, had a pretty good explanation, better than you get in most money and banking textbooks, which make up some efficiency argument. He says, look, uh, they found out that gold was a constraint. It was hard to come by. And so it's easier to back your money with something that's easier to come by, namely nothing. Uh, and, and that's about it, right? Gold was a constraint. Uh, governments chafed under that constraint. And finally, uh, in stages, we were weaned from the gold standard, and Nixon finally shut the gold window in 1971. So we've got fiat regimes now. So how are they doing? Well, not so good lately. Uh, as has been mentioned, uh, inflation in the Eurozone, top 10%. In the U.S., not much different. Uh, we got up to 9.1%, so that's the monthly CPI over the previous year's CPI. So why have, have we had this outburst of such high inflation? Well, money printing, basically. There's a, from a documentary about uh, Jerome Powell. Here he is cranking out the dollars. Now, in some ways, the expansion of the money supply in 2020 in response to the pandemic to the extent that people were hoarding money or in quantity theoretic terms, there was a big drop in the velocity of money. An increase in the quantity of money was warranted to keep total spending from collapsing. The problem is that as spending began to return to normal after 2020, central banks did not start pulling money out at the appropriate rate uh, to keep total spending from exceeding previous trends. And in the U.S. and in the Eurozone, nominal spending is way above the previous trend, and so, therefore, the price level has been above trend. But the track record of fiat standards uh, performing poorly relative to gold and silver standards doesn't just begin in 2020. Uh, and the most systematic study I know of was by Rolnick and Weber. They compared as many regimes as they could get long time series data on. So they took for each country its experience under a gold and silver standard and compared it to its experience under fiat money. And in every single country, the inflation rate has been higher under fiat money. Uh, this chart didn't appear in the published version of the paper, but it was in one of their working paper versions. And in this sample of countries, the average inflation rate under gold or silver standards was 
under fiat standards was 13%, and that's tossing out the German hyperinflation. Because you throw in a hyperinflation, it kind of skews your average. But even leaving that out, it's a dramatic difference uh, in the performance of the two monetary standards. And every country sampled had a higher inflation rate under fiat money than under gold and silver standards. And the, the, answer, the reason is pretty simple, that it's easier to expand the money supply and it's tempting to expand the money supply if you are the government that gets it to spend it into circulation. Uh, we heard this morning about right, the Cantillon effects, the beneficiaries being uh, the first spenders especially, which is the government that's issuing the fiat money. So what do we do about this problem? Well, we can try to you know, give good advice to central banks, and I'm in favor of that we can be a little more serious about it and try to change the constraints that central banks work under. And there have been two traditions in thinking about the constraints that central banks issue fiat money under. One tradition is to try to impose rules, some kind of binding constraints on the expansion of money. And inflation targeting was mentioned this morning. Uh, a famous rationale for this was provided by Kidlin and Prescott who said, really, uh, a central bank issuing a fiat money has to persuade the public that it's committed to low inflation or they don't get all the benefits of low inflation. If the public expects high inflation and inflation comes in under, that is, aggregate demand is not growing fast enough to support that, you get a recession. You get people surprised by how little money growth there is. So it, it actually helps the central bank achieve its own targets better if they commit to not inflating. Because if they don't, then you get a bad equilibrium in which people expect inflation, and if the central bank wants to avoid disappointing them in order to avoid a recession and high unemployment, they have to provide high inflation. So you get a high inflation that doesn't accomplish anything, doesn't even have uh, any short-run benefits, let alone no long-run benefits. But there's a second tradition uh, associated with Hayek's denationalization of money, which has been mentioned once, more than once today. And so I'm thinking in, along these second lines. Uh, of course, Hayek's proposal was that we should open competition among monetary standards and that this kind of competition would put some constraints on every issuer of money. And his initial proposal was open the competition so that any citizen of any country can use whatever monies are available issued by whatever other country, uh, or they could put themselves back on a gold standard, but he didn't per expect that to be very popular. In denationalization, he widened it and said, well, we could have private firms issuing money if they could establish credible reputations for carrying through on their promise to keep the purchasing power of the money stable. So he imagined private firms issuing their own liabilities with a commitment of some kind to uh, price stability. But it wasn't a, a legal commitment. It wasn't a redemption contract. It wasn't that any issuer would be legally obliged to buy their own money back in exchange for the CPI bundle or any other uh, subset of commodities. Well, we've gotten a little closer to Hayek's world with the opening of cryptocurrencies. Right, so Bitcoin introduced a private currency and uh, quite remarkably has achieved a positive value and has lots of ancillary institutions and networks built around it. Uh, and it's proved quite robust as a value transfer system. Uh, and the total value of the Bitcoin in circulation, I checked this a few days ago, it was 581 billion. Uh, it's a little less when Bitcoin is below 30,000 per coin, but at 30,000 per coin, total stock of Bitcoin is worth about 581 billion dollars. That's a pretty remarkable achievement. It's not, however, a commonly accepted medium of exchange. It's a new asset category. People invest in it. Uh, people don't buy coffee with it. There are other cryptocurrencies, whose symbols I put here, but none of which 
really have the credibility that Bitcoin has, don't have the market share that Bitcoin has. Uh, and so I don't try to consider each one of them uh, individually as potential media of exchange. But I will talk about Bitcoin's potential to serve as a, a world currency. Uh, the same technology that Bitcoin runs on, blockchain technology for making transfers from one address to another, has been adopted by people issuing claims to gold. Uh, the earliest one was Tether Gold, but the more, most popular one right now is called Pax Gold. It's a little more popular because it's a little more transparent, a little more credible about actually having the gold in vaults that people have claims to. Uh, so it's the finest gold on blockchain. And in addition, there have been non-blockchain-based kind of banking institutions uh, or gold depositories that also provide a transfer service. So you can make an easy transfer to anyone who already has an account. But since each of these just has a few customers, none of those has become any generally accepted medium of exchange either. Whereas Tether and Pax, you can sell uh, very easily on cryptocurrency exchanges. There we go. So in order to compare uh, the potential use of gold and Bitcoin as media of exchange, I want to examine what determines their purchasing power. And the economics of a gold standard are not all that difficult. It's a matter of supply and demand. Uh, it's no longer part of the money and banking curriculum very few of my fellow economists have ever thought about, uh, this room accepted, of course, uh, have ever thought about the supply and demand for gold. Uh, and there are a lot of myths out there. I have a whole chapter in my book devoted to knocking down some very simple misunderstandings of how supply and demand work in the case of a gold standard, both by its critics and by its supporters. Uh, but here's how I understand it. There's a supply curve and a demand curve. The demand curve is downward sloping, plotted where the quantity is plotted against the purchasing power of gold, that's PPG. And you can think of that as one over the price level where prices are measured in units of gold. And it's downward sloping for the usual reason that the higher the purchasing power of each unit, the fewer units you need to accomplish the transactions you want to accomplish. So, in fact, every point on the curve, the, the product of the purchasing power per unit times the number of units should be the same number. What people care about is the real value of the money balances they hold. So that's the demand curve. The supply curve, we have to distinguish between the short run and the long run. These are short run supply curves. They're upward sloping because these are supply curves for monetary gold, and there's lots of non-monetary gold above ground, mostly in the form of jewelry, but there are some other things, I don't know, picture frames, candlesticks, flatware, that can potentially, uh, but especially jewelry, can potentially be melted down and coined and will be melted down and coined if the value of coins goes up, right? The value of gold per ounce goes up, that makes it more expensive to hold gold in non-monetary form and some people will melt it down and have it coined. Uh, so I'm assuming here that there's, there's free coinage. And I should say that when I'm talking about the gold standard here, I'm abstracting from central banks. I'm assuming a world with no central banks, uh, a gold standard run through entirely through market institutions. Of course, central banks have never run the gold mining industry, uh, and that's the level I'm at now. Uh, and I'm assuming anybody can have their gold coined or melt it down. Uh, so in the short run, if there's an increase in demand, all right, so there's your demand curve shift as that solid arrow, the immediate impact will be to raise the purchasing power of gold and increase the quantity of monetary gold a bit. So you're moving up the short run supply curve. But that's not the end of the story because now the purchasing power of gold is above uh, the long run trend in the value of gold 
And what do I mean by that? Well, at this higher price, gold miners are going to find that it pays to dig a little deeper. And there'll be more exploration of ways to convert low quality ore into gold and so on. And so over time, and that's the dashed line, the supply curve will shift to the right. It'll shift to the right as the increased flow of gold out of the gold mines accumulates and accumulates in the form of people having it coined. So in the long run, we get back to equilibrium when we get back to the original purchasing power of gold. So purchasing power of gold has a mean reverting tendency in the face of shocks to demand or one-time shocks to supply. Now, uh, a fuller story includes a diagram so this is a diagram for gold stocks. A fuller telling of the story will have a diagram for the flow market. But so far, I'm assuming that there haven't been any shifts in the flow market. That is, there's no shift in the industrial demand for gold, and there's no shift in the costs of mining gold. Can you advance it? Yeah, Went too far. So an implication of this story is that if you have secular growth in the economy, such that the demand, transactions demand for money is growing over time, that will put upward pressure on the value of gold. That will stimulate more mining each year. So you should see a correlation between uh, the growth in the economy and the growth in the monetary gold stock. And using other people's data, uh, here's what I've constructed. You can, uh, the gold stocks numbers come from a study by Hugh Rockoff, and the real output by uh, the Madison Project, and the years don't line up exactly, but they're pretty close. So 1807 to 1869, or for output 1820 to 1870, you had lower growth in real output than in the later years. So you had about 2% growth in real output and slightly less than 2% growth in the stock of monetary gold. In the next 50 years after that, you get, with industrialization, you get faster growth in real output. And not coincidentally, because otherwise you wouldn't be at longer on equilibrium, the upward pressure that puts on the purchasing power of gold induces more growth in the uh, stock of gold. So these are growth rates on the vertical axis. So faster growth in demand for money gives you, the gold money gives you faster growth in the supply, and that stabilizes the purchasing power of gold over these long horizons. So it's not an accident, the way some people have imagined, that gold had such a stable purchasing power under the classical gold standard. There's some variation, it's not perfectly smooth, but it keeps coming back to the purchasing power of gold as determined by uh, the marginal cost of mining. So Bitcoin is designed very differently. Bitcoin does not have any elasticity to the supply. In fact, it's a, a vertical supply curve, as I'll draw it in a second. But here's what you often see the quantity of Bitcoin is on a programmed path. There's a release schedule that's in the source code. Anybody can see it. And it tells you how many Bitcoin there are going to be at any date in the future. Uh, right now, 2023, we've mined about 90% of all the Bitcoin that's going to be mined. So that it peaks, it, it flattens out at 21 million units at some date in the distant future. Uh, but we're 90% there. Uh, which means that in response to changes in the purchasing power of Bitcoin, there's no response. Right? The path is on autopilot uh, with no feedback. The, the downward sloping curve shows you the rate of growth of Bitcoin as a percent of the Bitcoin already existing. And each four years approximately, there's a, the rate of growth is cut in half. That's in the program that Nakamoto wrote. Uh, Bitcoin people call this the heavening. But it's, it's perfectly predictable, and so it's all priced in. It's not surprising to anybody when it happens. It's known in advance. 
But that gives you a vertical supply curve plotted against the purchasing power of Bitcoin, which means that when you have a shift in the demand, it's all going into the price. There's no quantity response to absorb any of the increased demand. Whereas, by contrast, just even in the short run, you get absorption of some of the demand in gold by the conversion of non-monetary gold to monetary gold. So you get less of a change in the price. Right? But that's just the short run. In the long run, the difference is even more dramatic because in the long run, the supply of gold can be thought of as being flat. Uh, Milton Friedman, in his famous uh, uh, attempt to estimate the resource costs of a gold standard, took this to be the uh, relevant model. And his, his measure of the resource cost is basically the number of ounces of gold that have to be mined every year to keep the purchasing power constant expressed as a share of national output. So even in the long run, the supply curve for Bitcoin is vertical. You still get that big movement in price as a result of a given demand shock, whereas in the long run, you get no, in the, uh, again, assuming no change in the technology of gold mining, you get no change in the uh, purchasing power of gold. So that's a pretty dramatic difference. Uh, gold has a much more stable purchasing power and a much more predictable purchasing power because at long horizons, you can be pretty sure that if you issue a bond denominated in gold, the value of gold's not going to be so different when it gets paid back to you from what it is today. Whereas with Bitcoin, who knows? And that's why we don't see financial markets for contracts denominated in Bitcoin. It's just too risky for both sides of the transaction. So historically, uh, the supply of monetary gold grew at, according to Rockoff's estimate, 2.9% a year over the, you might call this the long 19th century. Uh, but the point I'm making is that the rate of growth varied as a result of supply responses to demand shocks. So probably the biggest demand shock is when Germany and France decide to join the gold standard in the 1870s. But in response to that, there's an increase in, uh, that has a temporary effect of raising the purchasing power of gold. But in response to that, there's more gold mining uh, and the purchasing power of gold comes back to its long run trend. Now you do have some exogenous supply shocks in the case of gold. Uh, which you don't have in the case of Bitcoin, so score one advantage for Bitcoin. The California discovery was the biggest one of those in the 19th century, uh, but it was small by comparison to supply shocks under fiat standards. The California gold discovery added something like 1.3% inflation for about a dozen years. Uh, it wasn't that big an effect by reference to the kind of inflation rates we're uh, accustomed to today. But as I said, Bitcoin, uh, the growth of Bitcoin is unaffected by its purchasing power. And so all the effect of supply, uh, sorry, demand variations is felt in the price. The volatility is built into the price, sorry, built into the design of the supply mechanism. And in some commentaries on his program, Nakamoto said, well, it would have been nice to build in some feedback, but I don't know how to do that. And if, in order to do that, you'd have to have some observations from the real world being taken into account, but I don't know a trustless way to do that. So I'm just gonna do it this way. Uh, plus, this has the advantage that if Bitcoin starts to get popular, the price goes up, and that may attract more users. Okay, but that's going to attract the kind of users who are hoping for capital gains, who are willing to speculate. It's not going to attract people who want a stable, valued medium of exchange. And so that's the box that Bitcoin is now in. It's popular as a mechanism for speculating on the future of Bitcoin. But it's not clear what the fundamentals are that you should be speculating on. Now, Bitcoin does have one very important use. I mean, it does have a use case, and that is you can make payments without rooting them through the status quo banking system. 
So if, this is an example that uh, Alex Gladstein uses, if you want to send money to a dissident group in Belarus, let's say, you can't wire them dollars or euros. The government doesn't let them have a bank account. Your payment goes from your bank to your central bank to their central bank, and there it stops. It's never going to get to them. But you can send them Bitcoin. And there's a local market, a black market, of course, where they can sell the Bitcoin for local currency and carry on their activities. So censorship-resistant payments is the leading use case uh, for Bitcoin now, other than hoping that the price goes up. But here's the volatility. Uh, so this is a pretty long sample, 12 years, and Bitcoin is at the top, where the volatility per 60-day period is 8.23%, whereas gold is 1.73, and the euro to the dollar is 1.28. So, yeah, the price of gold is a little more volatile than the exchange rate between two fiat currencies, but it's nowhere near as volatile as the price of Bitcoin. If you look at it on a daily basis, the red spikes are Bitcoin. Every other exchange rate in the middle, <laughs> dollar against the pound, the euro, the yen, and gold, you can see that's a much smaller order of magnitude. Uh, so what does that mean? It means that I don't think Bitcoin's going to be a popular medium of exchange. So we've talked about you know, competition among monetary standards. How practical is it really? Well, there are some legal obstacles. So at the very least, uh, if we want competition on an open field, we need to dismantle those. That is differential tax treatments that disadvantage holding uh, gold or Bitcoin versus holding foreign exchange or domestic currency. But the big elephant in the room is the network advantage of an established currency. It's hard to get a new currency off the ground. Everybody, as Carl Menger taught us, this is an Austrian economics conference, as Carl Menger taught us, people want to converge on a money. They want to be paid in the thing that their trading partners are most likely to accept. I mean, that's what drove the initial convergence to money. And it means that there's not much incentive to be the first person to adopt a new money. That's how are you going to spend it? Nobody else has adopted it yet. Now, I don't want to overstate the problem. We heard about dollarization, including unofficial dollarization. Given a bad enough incumbent currency, people will begin to switch. Uh, but at moderate rates of inflation, you don't see much switching. So if you want to take market share away from an incumbent currency, you need to have a lower inflation rate, and you need to have at least a comparable, if not a lower, volatility. Uh, and that's you know, a disadvantage of Bitcoin and an advantage of dollars in countries with unstable currencies. So in Venezuela, in the heights of the hyperinflation, that was such an extreme case, and the government was suppressing people using dollars, you did see spontaneous reemergence of a gold standard. In the mining regions of Venezuela, people were using gold flakes as a medium of exchange. There are news stories where you can see photos of stores that have a scale next to their cash register, and goods are priced both in uh, dollars and in ounces of gold. Uh, and this photo I saw of somebody, you know, paying with a flake of gold. Uh, in the cities, people started using Bitcoin as a medium of exchange. Now, people who are, you know, wired, people who are connected, there were interesting stories of people earning income in Bitcoin and then to buy groceries, they would sell the Bitcoin locally to other people who wanted to put their savings in Bitcoin. So you did actually have medium of exchange use of gold and Bitcoin uh, in Venezuela. Once the government relaxed the restrictions against the use of dollars, the dollar has pretty much dominated now. And uh, 
you see pictures of taxis in Venezuela uh, on the dash, oh, sorry, on the windshield say, have signs that say, we accept Zell, <laughs> which is the inner bank transfer system in the United States. And this is baffling the people who run Zell, which is a consortium of the major banks, because how are these Venezuelans getting access to Zell accounts? It's all kind of a gray market, but uh, in Venezuela, of course, it's called Zaya, not Zell. Anyway, in practical terms, the dollar has been the popular alternative. And so to switch out of fiat money into gold or Bitcoin, we're going to have to wait for some pretty terrible inflation across all the major fiat currencies. So not something to hope for, but still something to prepare for. That is, we should think about plan B uh, in the case all the fiat currencies uh, don't perform as well as the most optimistic among us would hope. So if it came down to a choice between gold or Bitcoin, which would be the more likely candidate? Well, I've already indicated I think gold would be. It's got the same blockchain transaction technology now for those who want that. Or you can hold it physically if you're old fashioned. You can own ETFs. Uh, and because of that, gold has a, actually a larger installed base of users than Bitcoin. As I said, Bitcoin is worth about half a billion dollars. Just monetary uses of gold add up to about four and a half trillion dollars. That is, individuals owning gold coins, bullion, and ETFs. If you, if you count all the gold above ground, including jewelry, you get, and central bank reserves, you get 11 trillion. Uh, so people are accustomed to gold. Uh, in many countries, it's a popular savings vehicle. But more importantly, it's, uh, most importantly, I think, its purchasing power is much less volatile and will remain so. It's not the case that Bitcoin's going to become less volatile just as time goes on because there's no change in the design. There's nothing that's going to make it less volatile, and we haven't empirically seen any reduction in volatility uh, in those charts I showed you. Bitcoin does have one advantage in that it's a little harder to shut down completely Right? To use gold transfers, there has to be a vault somewhere where there is gold and a determined government can find that and shut it down if it's within the borders. If it's outside the borders, a little harder to shut it down. Uh, but even in the case of Bitcoin, a government that's determined to not allow it to become a medium of exchange can drive it underground. And driving it underground means it's very hard, you know, making it illegal to advertise that you accept Bitcoin, making it illegal to have owner to own Bitcoin or to transfer it. Those are hard to detect. But the only people who are going to use it then are people who are willing to break the law. Uh, there are people in China today using Bitcoin, even though it's illegal. I hope that's not shocking. Uh, and they use it because the alternative is to be inside a very heavily surveilled banking system. So if you want to make transactions privately, you can use Bitcoin. But that's a very small group of people who are savvy enough uh, to do that. There's another possibility that I want to mention here at the end, and that's, uh, I, that's why it's a question of better among the known candidates. There could be something like Hayek imagined on a blockchain technology. So you've all heard about stable coins, but a stable coin is stable in terms of some fiat money. It's only as stable as the fiat money. So people who held Tether US dollar or USDC suffered 9% inflation loss in purchasing power the way the rest of us did. It's not all that stable. If you have a current coin that is stabilized in purchasing power, so it's indexed to some measure of uh, the price index, the CPI or the GDP deflator, the new terminology for that is it's a flat coin. Right? It has a flat purchasing power profile. And there are projects now to launch flat coins. Uh, 
and we'll see how they, uh, they pan out. But a flat coin in, in one design is a stable coin, that is, it's a pegging scheme. You can trade it every day at the same price. A second possibility is to design a cryptocurrency where the supply is elastic in the long run the way gold was. A little faster, right? It doesn't have to be a matter of 10 years before the supply responds in full. So disclaimer, I'm consulting with a project that, that's trying to do this. And we should be launching in a few months. Uh, the, the project is called Saga Coin. And the idea is, as the purchasing power goes up, issue more of it to bring the purchasing power back down to a target. If the purchasing power goes down, burn it. Make the quantity shrink until the purchasing power comes back up to the target. And this is not done by a discretionary committee. This is all going to be programmed. Right? So there's a program supply response uh, mechanism. So wish us luck, but we'll, we'll see how that pans out. In the meantime, there is gold uh, directly. And I will take questions. Thank you.